Well, welcome to Startups On Demand, sponsored by New York Tech Media. Today, I've got the awesome Noah Ashed, uh, a founder and CEO of Bold Digital. Uh, Digital. She is an amazing marketer. Um, we've been in touch, I think, for a few for a few months right now. She also has a super incredible podcast um, that is distributed in C Tech and also on their website. Um, real super heroes right what's the real correct powers real life superpowers i was i was close but it's right. it's a really it's a really great um show they they really you know they drill down and they kind of talk to ex amazing leaders and they really ask practical questions it's she does noah does it with the onan many paths who is also someone who was on the show i think six or seven months ago so Noah, thank you so much for being on this on this show and taking the time for this thank you for inviting me of course, you're awesome. And I think like my audience will be, you know, we'll get tons of value um, from this conversation. So I really want to focus this conversation around attribution. Um, we talked a little bit about this prior to this call, and I know this is something you're super passionate about. Um, modern marketing attribu uh, attribution is kind of messed up right now. Um, can you take it away and let us know why, why you think that is? And what are some of the opportunities? That, that marketers can utilize right now? Yes. So basically, I think that a lot of the really important marketing efforts are very hard to measure. And then on the other end, there's all these paid efforts that are fairly easy to measure, but are not accurate in any way. So basically, if you're paying big tech, you're probably going to get some sort of impact with respect to what you see. But that's like such a partial, partial picture. Because at the end of the day, if you're going on a podcast or arranging an event, or if you're investing in content, or if you're, if you're doing social media and doubling down on that and PR, as you well know, then how can you tell at the end of the day if that converted into clients? It's very difficult, but it's actually probably what's working best for you. And in that sense, I think that focusing on Google Analytics and the current attribution models is very, very blinding. Uh, I think that is super correct. And we kind of talked about how, you know, Chris Walker, that's like his gist, right? That's what he's talking about all day long on LinkedIn, how the attribution model is kind of broken. And I want to I want to talk a little bit about the specifics. So, you know, if maybe 10, 10 years ago, people would, you know, basically optimize for SEO or for, you know, specific ads in specific uh, places, Right now, like there's a big gap because so much of you know marketing is being done on social media. Um, if you're in B2B, then LinkedIn and Twitter specifically. And there is no like easy way to kind of measure your impact. And also your content compounds over time. So if you know you can't just write do six weekly LinkedIn posts and expect to see results after a week. It's like it takes time. But then there's like this exponential exponential point where suddenly you've built a brand, and you know we've seen that with companies like Gong, and we've seen that with companies like Walnut. Um, and I want to kind of ask you: so you you're you're working in like the back the back end of all those stuff, you know, you're actually writing that content. Um, how do you? What do you do when like a client comes to you and says, okay, so what's the ROI on our activity? Like what's your go-to answer for that? So the way I approach this is to try and show them the impact through harder to measure metrics, meaning uh, over time, showing direct traffic to the website growing and showing branded searches, meaning actually people looking for stuff related to the brand that's clearly or intuitively has to do with the thought leadership work. And then there's also signups to the newsletter that start growing and followers on social media. And all these elements really paint a picture of actual impact. Now, it's not like you can say, okay, this specific uh, lead was generated through this effort or other. But if you think about it, it makes the most sense that actually showing growth in those metrics is a clear indication that something is working. And, and it's problematic because you can't say, okay, that podcast appearance is what made this work, but you have to look at the big picture. And, you know, theoretically, if you just silence all other efforts, then it would be very easy to understand. But it's very rare that if ever that that happens. But that's what I suggest doing. 
And I want to add to that, that at the end of the day, when um, when startups focus on just, you know, the paid efforts and the and the the high intent clients and try to get leads through that, through SEO and through paid efforts, then they're only looking at like 3% of their potential audiences. At the end of the day, the number of audiences, the, the percentage of audiences that truly want to buy from you and are ready is very low. 97% of the target audience of B2B startups is not even aware of their problem or at least not aware of the solution. And that's what I think startups double down on, which is basically what's called demand gen. But you know, this it's like, there's all these terminologies for this. Like it's it was called inbound marketing before and there's mm -hmm. always these names, but it's, it's the same. At the end of the day, you're trying to build a brand, you're trying to position it and you're trying to build trust. And that's what I think startups are supposed to do. I love it. I love it. Um, I'll give you. I'll give you. Uh, I'll share with you and, and the audience some some interesting stuff. So, you know, um, there are clients in our agency that we automatically have like great chemistry, and I think that's probably maybe sixty or seventy percent of the clients. You know, they have they understand the management marketing and they understand you know how what we think about PR and everything. And then there's about like the 30% of clients or prospects or whatever that they that I never understand how they think. So they will always come to me and say, listen, listen, Omri, so is this article, what's the ROI on this article? Or what's the ROI on like getting this article? Or is it? And I tell them, listen, guys, it's not, you can't measure something by one specific thing. It's a compound effect. It's, 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 you know, it's the the combining you know, value of, of doing PR consistently, of posting on social media consistently. You can't, there's no like specific thing. And, you know, the way I kind of, the the way I, I, so I had really deep conversations with like CEOs and stuff like that. And I tell you what they told me, and maybe you can kind of expand on that. They told me, listen, Omri, I, we, we believe, we understand that. We, you know, we're with you completely, but we have limited budget because we're a startup and we have to show results very quickly. And then they told, they, they tell, they basically tell me, you know, what they teach us in business school or something is the Pareto principle. So you need to try to do the 20% that leads to the 80%. But in marketing, it's a bit tricky because it's really hard to tell what the 20% is. And sometimes even the 80% that only brings in the 20%, sometimes that is super, super valuable. So I'm really interested to hear what your take on that is and how do you kind of think about that? I got to ask you first, how many times did you see a startup with that attitude succeed? Never. Okay, so basically those are the type of clients that if you decide to keep working with, you sort of know that there's like a sand clock that's tipped and it's just a matter of time. And you can do your best to try and educate them as you go. Uh, probably not going to work most of the time. Uh, but for those who are willing to listen and are like, I, I got to say that attitude is typically coming from pressure from above. So and, and the younger the, the CEO or management, the more that's going to make an impact because, you know, like an experienced CEO, maybe like one who already like went through an exit or something is probably going to be a lot more uh, tolerant to, to just taking a breath and understanding they're playing a long-term game. Uh, and, and those are the ones who are, there's a reason why they win. Uh, but for the others and who are under pressure, basically somebody is telling them, listen, Generally, marketing seems like fluff to us. Let's just uh, give this. Let's let's just double down on sales. Do cold outreach and outbound, and let's get let's just get sale marketing. Sorry to do you know like nice uh, sales decks uh, and collateral. Mm -hmm. And you know if we do have extra budget, then we can maybe do a little bit of social media and PR. But that's gonna circle back to why did we do that PR? Unless, unless, by, by the way, PR is a sort of uh, an exception because everybody, not everybody, but most people are ego driven. Like they won't admit it, mm -hmm. but they, they are like people like to be in the press and people like even, I don't know, to show mom and to show the people at school that they were on Forbes. It's just life. Uh, it, and, and I think it drives a lot of PR, not like the intent and a lot of the PR and, and that type of work beyond getting leads is that. 
but that's okay because it serves a higher purpose because it does generate the leads. And so, it's great business and it's great business for the agencies. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, we know that it's also actually important. But, yeah. you know, within all those like human uh, considerations to take, you know, just to think about like we, we as marketers have to sort of navigate egos and, and try to keep our eyes on what the goal should be because sometimes you really have to help the the um, founders or whoever is in, in charge sort of get in on the right track with all the pressure around them and with the perception that marketing is fluff and not necessary and sales is what they should double down on and the best teams are the ones where there's sales and marketing alignment uh, alignment and the marketing is actually something that's perceived as, as, as important so through that I think the way to actually convince is to explain a like I read this article by Rand Fishkin that was really eye opening for me, but he talks about getting buy in through showing them that competitors are doing this because that also mm -hmm. again circling back to ego, but that works and also trying to ask for time to prove meaning show them, for example, what the conversion rates from uh, free to paying customers is over time and then sort of predict what's going to happen if you don't do any marketing activities and then try to see what happens when you do. And then mm -hmm. over time, you can actually prove value. People seem to think that there's no, that there's absolutely no way to prove value. It's just really hard to measure and it requires a certain mindset, but it's possible. I will, I will comment on two things you said. Um, so that I, I agree, I agree with them on, on both sides. So the first thing is about the ego thing. So, so I'll give you something, another insider kind of take from something that we see. So, you know, you know how we're vocal about our clients. You know, every time our client gets coverage, we do a lot of social media around it. We like to amplify it. Every time, you know, we have a client that knows about our other client and he sees like a big article about that client, they come to me and say, Aubrey, but, but we also want to be in Forbes. But, but then I tell them, what do you mean? But yesterday we talked about targeting this specific niche publication that is valuable for your audience. What happened? You know what happened? Ego. They, 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 you know, jealousy. They became envious of the other company. And that's a big problem. By the way, strong, strong CEOs don't get that. They're, they're playing on a different, and you know this, maybe more than I do. They play on a different game. They don't even care. Okay, be... Like, I know what my goals are and I'm super committed. And those are the ones who play the long-term game and actually win. And then the second thing you said, which um, you, you said, so then, you know, startups with limited budget, they say, okay, let's amplify sales. Let's go all, all in on sales. And then what happens? They do this spammy LinkedIn DMs, right? The, their brand automatically looks like garbage because they just spam you and nobody, you know, they don't build a brand. Then their investors ask, like, where's the where's the thing, right? Where's the actual, like, um, revenue, ROI. ROI? And then you know what happens? This is super interesting. Because they did, they, they tried to go all in on sales early on, and they didn't build brand and do market education, then they think they don't have product market fit. Even if they do. Even if eventually they will have, they think they don't. Why? Because they say, we hustle. We try to bring in sales, but there's probably no product market fit. But if they build it that brand, they could actually manufacture that product market fit in the long term. I, I agree so much. And sometimes it's also a result of missing a few steps in the process. So, you know, they, they, everybody, every startup should do buy a persona research. So basic, but how many truly do? And I don't mm -hmm. mean guessing i mean actually sitting down with your best clients and talking to them and seeing why they chose you and who they are and where they hang out online and truly understanding them and understanding that you can't serve everybody so you got to see who you're providing true value for and if you don't yet have real clients then you can sit down with potential clients and understand who they are. And then through that research, you can also understand what product market fit truly is for you. Because if you get like 10 different answers, but you start seeing some 
sort of common denominator between those, then you can try to sort of hone. And not to mention at the end of the day, startups that don't have their ear to the ground and aren't getting feedback and aren't truly understanding where their product actually fits the market, they, they can't succeed. So the idea is to truly listen and adjust and not just assume anything because you just through what you just gave is an example of assuming you don't have a market fit when the reality is there's probably a very different reason for that. Exactly. And so really, when we get in new clients, the first thing, not a first thing, obviously, but one of the things I tell them is, listen, especially clients who don't, who are, who are really looking for like revenue into collect, or, or trying to get into like a new market, like expanding the US, expanding to the UK, I tell them, listen, you have a prospect list, right? Instead of, you know, um, spamming them and trying to get like a meeting, Build a podcast, something that you do really good with your clients, and interview them. Just interview them to kind of understand what's going on, right? Like, what's <clears throat> what are their pain points? It's so easy, and the ROI on it is, like, instrumental. Why? Because you get three things. One, you get deep customer insights. Two, once you post the, article, the podcast, their, pros their, their competitors see that they talk to you, so it increases your brand. And three, your, your reach is you're able to tap into other, you know, influencers' audience or the per other person you interviewed, his audience, right? And you're so, warming the relationship with them. And that's the most important thing. You're warming the relationship with them, which, I did, which is like the obvious thing, right? So it's like, and this is like, like, there's no cost to this. It's like free. It's just your time, which is valuable, but it's a great ROI on your time for sure. So like, how do you, so, okay, so when you, and I'm really interested in this, when you kind of sign on a new client, when you guys are starting to work with a new client, and I, I just want to add something about your agency that maybe people that don't know you, you directly don't know. So a lot of the content that you guys see, like on thought leadership, and that seems that has been written by like a CEO or something, that's actually no on her team. <laughs> So like, I'm really interested to learn, like, what's the, what's the few, first things you do when you kind of onboard a new client? Yeah, that's really interesting. And it's a process that's been honed, honestly, for years and keeps getting honed. Um, but the thought is that you can't provide true value to a client if you don't understand them to a depth as if you were part of the team and one of the more motivated team members. And that means to truly, truly understand the product. And that sometimes can be very challenging because some of our clients are like very sophisticated, like AI types of technologies, um, but there's no way around it. Like the idea is to really understand what they do, how they do it, you know, and sort of see what other, what, what their product offering is in depth, uh, who their buyer personas are and what their brand framework is, what their vision is, what their mission is, which is something that in you know past years I thought was complete fluff. And now it seems like every piece of content that's been written is really, ha really has that brand framework as a Northern star, because mm -hmm. suddenly understand that it's very meaningful to understand, to say, to have that vision of, what is that startup really trying to aim for? And it also helps the startup around align around what they're really trying to convey, the messaging, the positioning, and it's it makes everything a lot more focused and clear. So there's the brand framework, there's the buyer persona, there's truly understanding and jumping on calls and getting them demos, and then it's understanding the style and how they would really communicate. And one thing that we try to think is if they were speaking on stage and giving a talk, how would they talk? You you really try to understand the person. Now, it's not like the clients can put us on autopilot because it's it's deep like content with insights that at the end of the day, we need them to brief us on. So they they have to be a part of it. Um, through the years, some clients are able to let go a bit. It's mostly, you know, I think a lot of them want to let go way before we enable it. Uh, mm. But we we want to get it right. And right is, um, there's many layers to right. 
Mm -hmm. uh, because they take a lot of content, especially in an era that's very focused on writing for search en engines. I think a lot of the content can fly. Uh, and, and I'm sure a lot of the content that we write um, could have would have been approved by clients at a much lower quality. And not because I think they uh, aren't smart or critical, but I think they, you know, they, they're busy and they see that it reads well and they, they would go with the lower quality, but we really feel like there's significance in what we put out. Uh, so that's how we approach it. And, and through that, we try to understand, okay, what are the best tactics to truly leverage what we do? Where are the places where would be the optimal touch points for this specific startup? Where should they be online? Where are their clients hanging out online or prospects? And through that, we map out very tailored plans for each startup. You know, you said something really interesting that, you know, you know, like uh, there's AI um, platforms like Jasper or like AI writers. There's a tons of them where you can basically like auto generate full on articles like through SEO. And it's, and you know, in the old, like, because everybody was racing for like search engine optimization, they didn't care about the actual content. They only cared about the, you know, the keywords. And it's kind of bullshit because in, in the end, even if you bring someone into that content, that content needs to be unique and special to that, to the person who is reading it. Like there's no shortcuts around it. Like there's no, and then I think like a better framework like uh, for that, and we talked about it as well, is like the repurposing thing. So invest your time, write something that's super thoughtful, and then repurpose it. Make a, a smaller blog post out of it. Make a social media post out of it. Make a podcast episode out of it. Yes. And for, for more content, you got many, but it's still high quality instead of spammy. Yeah, and, and some like really practical tactics are share it on SlideShare. Make uh, quotes out of it and share those. Uh, leverage Scoop It and Stumble Upon and Reddit and Quora and the likes. Um, so there's so much that you can do to repurpose content. And I just want to say with respect to Jasper, um, I'm, I'm a great fan of such tools. I think a lot of the times it can help to inspire and it can even sometimes help you find a pun uh, that you weren't thinking of. Like mm. I'm, I'm mind blown specifically with Jasper uh, and also WordTune, if you know it. And if I yeah. recommend, it's it's fantastic. And it's something that like I use daily WordTune, like because for people that don't know, WordTune is just a, it's a Chrome extension where you basically highlight any sentence that you're writing and you're going to get suggestions for making this shorter, longer, uh, different style, casual, formal. Um, even if, you know, if, if somebody is writing like Google ads, you can get like 10 more versions just through that. And they're all, not all, but you know, the, the, the machines are only as good as, uh, as we are, as the people behind them. So mm -hmm. there's always a critical eye needed, but I think those are great additions to, to the work of content. And I'm in no way ashamed to say it. Like, I don't feel like it's a cheat even. I think it's, it's just a great supplement. I, I love it. And I'll just kind of, I'll just kind of like maybe rephrase what I, what I meant by saying that, Yes, I'm not against those platforms. I do think like they're super valuable. You just need to combine the hands-on with the AI touch and just oh, not like not just set it on like autopilot because it's just it's not meant for that. Listen, you guys, you're you said Quora. Man, you guys are <laughs> you guys are dominating on Quora. You guys yeah. have really you guys have really figured Quora out. And you guys have figured, if, like, I, I, there's really two things that I really love that you guys are doing. I'm not going to get into the specifics, so not kind of, like, reveal too much. But it's Quora, the way you guys do Quora, the way you guys, like, take Twitter, um, Twitter posts and, like, repurpose them on LinkedIn. I think both of those tactics are really strong. Can you kind of just, can you just, like, talk about Quora for, like, a minute or two? Just, like, kind of, like, explain your thought process? Yeah, sure. And I just gotta say, don't worry about revealing anything. I, I'm a mm -hmm. firm believer that there's no secrets uh, in in our type of work. Maybe not in any work. I think the knowledge is out there, and I'm not afraid that anybody will imitate us. I think we can only be, be only be better together. And I think even current competitors can be potential collaborators. So, love it. Really, uh, with respect to Quora, um, consistency. 
and finding relevant conversations and and truly writing opinions on those conversations like that's that's the trick that's it and with respect sorry yeah yeah and i just want to say that what i saw from your core work you guys don't answer it with just like a small answer you guys you guys publish you know semi full blown articles on Quora under the, the question, right? And that's amazing SEO value. And yeah, the SEO value of this is insane, actually. So I would be, I would just for the audience to kind of understand the context of this, I would like randomly search stuff that I am looking for, right? That I'm interested in. And her clients would be just dominating the search engine Quora answers. That's insane. Well, that's the purpose. And and just with respect to what you said about leveraging Twitter on LinkedIn, I, I honestly, that was something that we actually learned from you. Really? Yes. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Love it. Yes. I use it. I use it. I've been using it for a while and it's great. Like the algorithm plays for it, you know, and it's, it looks good because it's easier to read than just like the post that stands out. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, 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 uh, nice. I'm, um, it sounds good. Yeah. So you can, we can, you can always like learn so much stuff. Maybe I should kind of learn core from you guys. And so we can add it to our marketing mix. Anytime. Awesome. And I know you, I, I know you have to go soon, but just like my final question, I think. And once again, thank you so much for taking the time. I loved um, it. Any, uh, so obviously you're dominating in content, if it's the podcast, if it's, you know, the social media activity, the CTEC partnership, uh, but even before the CTEC partnership, like you've been dominating, you know, before that with your podcast. So the CTEC um, partnership is just another, you know, amplification for that. Um, is there any book or any other podcast or any other content persona or something that you kind of look for, look as an example for, do you, you know, that you- Sorry, I need to just ask for one more minute here. I apologize. No worries. Awesome, so, yeah. I, I love podcasts and audiobooks, and I can share endless lists of recommendations. I also, when I listen to stuff, I'm like always writing notes to myself on my Apple notes. Uh, so I have like an entire library of quotes and I wish somebody would invent like a really cool app that would enable me to just say, I want the text from this minute to that. So anybody listening, if you want to develop that, I'm going to pay. Uh, <laughs> my top podcasts are the James Altisher show, which is the inspiration uh, for our podcast and the Chase Jarvis show. If you know that, of the, course, the, the a photographer, yeah, creative live. Uh, and then there's like the really like the, the stuff like how I built this that I like and no stupid questions by Angela Duckworth and Stephen Dubner. But really, like, I, I listen to a lot, I love it. I, I'm, I'm, I love to learn, so I'm always that, that's my main way of learning. Love it. And last question favorite entrepreneur. Wow, that's really challenging. Um, there's so many. That's what I'm thinking. You can like, choose two. <laughs> like I want to say Richard Branson, but uh, you know that's so that's so Ronan. He sort of like he stole that name. Um, uh, I'll, I'll say James Altisher because I learned so mm. much from. Love it. Awesome, Noah. Thank you so much. And for the audience, go follow her on LinkedIn and see their awesome work and visit uh, boltdigital.com. Is that the yeah? yeah. Thank you so awesome. much for this, Maria. I had a great time. Thanks, Noah. Okay. Bye-bye.